folks, welcome to the first board game breakfast of March 2015. Uh, last week I had a chance to visit LA. I thought I would be busy the entire time. At the last minute found out I wouldn't be. Uh, sent out a little bit of a message. Got together with several of you to play games. Thank you very much for all those who were very kind and hospitable to me. Got to go to the Game House Cafe once again. And my apologies for those of you who I missed, but I'm sure I'll hit there again. Uh, maybe in 2016. <laughs> um, but uh, like I said, big week here. My daughter turns 15. Man, I was playing games with her when she was two. Uh, very excited to see how she's changed and grown. And so my happy birthday to you, Melody. And my other daughter, Claire. They have two uh, birthdays on the same day. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on this week. Other than that, though, this is also the week that my jury duty starts. So hopefully that won't mess us up too much, but I got my man Z here to help out, and so lots of exciting things. Tonight, I'll be doing a question and answer time. I'm going to do a very different time. I'll be doing it at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so uh, like I said, I do different times each week, so hopefully that will help some of you out. If you have questions asked, you can talk to me there, but let's get to the news. One of the biggest bits of news is that the Board Game Geek Awards were announced this week, but I'll be talking about that later on in Tom Thinks. Some uh, surprising news, Greater Than Games and Dice Hate Me Games have merged together. Dice Hate Me Games is becoming a brand underneath the Greater Than Games. Now, Greater Than Games has made several games, but their, their most popular game is Sentinels of the Multiverse. Dice Hate Me Games has made Compounded and Viva Java and a lot of great games. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that these two companies make the same kind of games, but the partnership does make sense on a strategic level. We have Greater Than Games, which has very good thematic games, and Dice Hate Me more with the strategic and sound mechanisms, and if they can work together and use the strengths of both companies, this will be interesting to see how this works out down the road. April 11th is Tabletop Day coming up. They just announced all the different uh, promo cards and things that will be available to stores there. In fact, there will be one for Sheriff of Nottingham on that day. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about all these promos. They're really cool, but from what I've found in the past, a lot of stores do not know how to hand these out, or they take them and just kind of randomly give them out, and it causes a bit of chaos sometimes. We'll see how different stores handle that. But either way, who cares about that? It's an exciting time. Um, I still will never understand why people get together just because we said they should, but hey, I'll take the excuse to get together. And if you're in South Florida, we're gonna have a fantastic time in gaming and we'd like to invite you to that. All right, uh, here's a picture that someone snapped of Tail Feathers. This is another game coming uh, down the line from Plan Hat Games in the, in the Mice and Mystics universe. What kind of game is it? We have no idea. Folks, Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Today our question comes from Seth, who says that he was playing a game of Zularetto and the game was going well, and then he got, he was forced in the very last turn to take a truck with three animals that he didn't have, that messed up his whole plan, and he found himself hating that mechanism that he normally loves. And he wants to know if we ever hate something that we normally love. Um, let's see. In general, I don't, if I like something, I usually like it. Um, I, I think I'm starting to hate Cosmic Encounter <laughs> because every One time moment. we play now, every time we play now, I get I somehow get negotiated out of ever being involved in any. Oh, everyone want to come on the call except for Jason. Um, I have no idea how that happens. <laughs> no, that's just the way it feels. I mean, if you're not winning, people. I mean, I always invite people who are not winning because that's what you do. Yeah. Um, no. No. In general, I don't think that there's. Um, to me. If I like a game, and even if the mechanic turns on me at some point, it's not that I hate the game or hate the mechanic anymore, because I still love it. And that's just the one game where you, where the bad thing happened that you ended up losing because of it. I can end up hating a mechanism if I have to use it too much in a game. Like, for example, drafting. Drafting's a fun thing to do. But if I have to draft and 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 draft, and draft you're like, stop. Too much drafting. So you've changed your opinion on Seven Wonders then? No, no, but Seven Wonders. <laughs> I'm joking. Seven Wonders, the drafting is a game. I, I was thinking more along the lines of uh, Neptune. In Neptune, there was this big drafting, and you just did it, and we did it, and we yes. did it, and we did it, and yes. then we played the game. And the game was fine. Neptune's fine, but I found myself not liking the mechanism as much because we just it kind of happened a lot. Yes. Um, or I might say, ooh, you roll a die to put random resources on the board. That's a cool mechanism, and then you roll it and roll it and roll it and roll it, and it's like ah. 
So repetition can ruin some mechanisms for me. But even if I get, if I love something, let's say simultaneous selection, I love, and I get destroyed in it every single time, I still think it's cool. Yeah. Even when I lose. I or, just don't mind losing that much. And that's a big difference, I think. Or secret bidding and then secret bidding and you realize that someone else bid four every time when you keep bidding three. Yeah, um, yeah. You're like, oh, I bid too low. Oh, I bid too low. But it's still a great mechanic. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I can see a bad experience can sour you on, a, on something in a game. But for me, it's not that big of a deal. But I think a lot of that's due to I just don't really care that much if I win or not unless it's against Jason. Yeah, so in general, you know, you might have that one bad experience, but play the game again and you'll have a better experience with the same mechanic that you love. All right, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Send us questions at dicetower at gmail.com. An unending tide of Imperial mooks. Robo Rally is another Richard Garfield robot-infested game from Hasbro's Wizards of the Coast's Avalon Hill line. In it, players control robots racing around a dangerous factory floor trying to hit all the checkpoints first or destroy the other robots with their head-mounted lasers. Movement is accomplished through programming cards, which are done in advance. One never knows whether one's perfectly programmed moves will be interfered with by the enemy. Friedman Freeze's Power Grid even has a robot expansion. You use it to build a variable robot AI opponent who, depending on which pieces you use, will react to the different phases of the game in different consistent ways. Being beaten at Power Grid isn't bad enough. Now you get to be beaten by a robot? Huh. Alex Randolph's Ricochet Robots from Z-Man Games is a puzzle game where the goal is to get the robot to the target in as few moves as possible. Robots move in straight lines until they hit an obstacle, at which point they change directions. This one's a real brain burner. You would think that robots would be easy to spot with their glowing red eyes and clanking metal arms. But if Battlestar Galactica has taught us anything, it's that robots can be anywhere, even under our own skin. In BSG The Board Game, players don't know who the robots are until it's all over. You may think you are human, and then find out, uh-oh, you're a robot. There are simpler secret identity games on the market, but none that blends mechanic and theme so well as Battlestar Galactica. One game that is not out yet that involves robots is the resurrected edition of Grave Robbers from Outer Space. Look for the Kickstarter campaign coming to a computer terminal near you. Now you may have noticed that uh, a couple weeks ago, me, Z, and Sam played a live playthrough of Smash Up. And Smash Up is fun, you know, you're playing cards on different sides, trying to find the breakthrough point of a base. And as you're doing this, you have to keep track of how many points are on the different sides of the base. So, uh, you know, every once in a while we'll stop and say, okay, this guy has three, this one is two, but it's plus one for each other War Raptor. So that's six plus four is 10 plus three, 13 plus 5 is 18. Well, we're still not at 24. That's fine, but you're constantly having to do that. Well, one of my listeners sent me in this, which I thought was really cool. It's like a player board here, and what you do is in the middle is you put the Antarctic base, and then I put the number here on here, so 24 is the is the smash up point and then I put a marker here and then each player so when I play this three we just simply add it like this and then maybe the steam queen is placed here it adds five more one two three four five and then a war raptor is three more and so this way it's just an easy way to keep track as you add different things to the base to keep track of how close you're getting to this breaking number point so this is a, just a small, minor thing, um, but something that I thought was a lot of fun. If you're interested in getting some of these for yourself, just email you and I'll put you in touch with the designer of these. I think they're pretty cool and we'll be using them in my games. Also, if you did not watch last Board Game Breakfast, please do so because there's a contest there that's going to end in one week. Hey everybody, Steve here from After Further Review. And this is the AFR 2-Minute Drill. 
It's actually sort of a slow news week in the sports board game world. So I thought I'd do something a little different. And I wanted to showcase to you one of my favorite games. And that game is History Maker Baseball from Play.com. Now, this game has a lot of the things that you'll find in other sports simulations. However, there's one big difference, and that's right on the player cards. As you can see, there are no numbers or stats on these cards. There are just attributes or qualities, as they're called in the game. And one of the great things is that the player cards can change. So take, for instance, this example. Burley is pitching to Santana, and a roll comes up asking if the batter has the home run king quality. And normally, Rico Santana does not. However, before the game started, a local media event came up and the result was that the manager was able to give a choice semi-quality to the hot batter of the game. And Rico Santana happened to be the hot batter and the manager gave him the home run king quality. And so just like that, an at-bat that could have resulted in a harmless fly out to left field instead ends up in the seats for a home run. So there you go, just a quick sample on how History Maker Baseball is a very different type of sports game, and maybe it's something that you could bring to your tabletop. Hope you enjoyed this segment. Please leave any comments or questions on the video below. And until then, I'll see you next time after further review. Now, Jury Duty may slow me down a little bit, but we still have many things coming from our contributors this week. Uh, we should get up a top 10 list this week. We'll be doing our top 10 Rio Grande games. Uh, we'll also, uh, I have a bunch of different reviews here. Here's an interesting one, Bycatch, that requires you to use a camera phone. The worst game ever, Shinobi Clans, uh, Pictomania, and Incredible Expeditions. And my, the biggest review I'll be doing this week is the DC Dice Masters game. So lots of cool things coming. Of course, uh, this week you'll hear our Total Con show. Uh, if you listen to Dice Tower, I'm not involved in this one at all. It's all Eric and the guys from Flip the Table uh, who did a sh uh, show at Total Con up in Massachusetts. So that'll be airing on our, on our website Tuesday. Our website is now by the way, in complete content edition. It's almost finished. We have a team of people, and thank you to all those who are helping, who are just uploading content and content and content. There's a lot of it, and cross-referencing the different content, so I'm really excited. We are planning to launch this website right now. The tentative date is March 21st, so that's not too far away. I look forward to showing it off and letting you guys uh, crawl around the website and look at all the different things there. Okay, let's move on. Chaz Marler of Pair of Dice Paradise, and today I'll be looking at board games that... What? I have done 50 of these Head in the Cloud segments? <laughs> this calls for a celebration! A party! A parade! Okay, well if not a parade, at least... at least a day off, okay? To honor the occasion, I'm gonna go do one of my favorite board game related activities. Ha <laughs> Uh... You guys are invited to come with me. <laughs> come on. One area of the board gaming hobby that doesn't get as much attention as I think it should is the art of thrifting. Going through the aisles of a thrift store looking for hidden gems can be almost as much fun as playing some games. I'm looking at you, Game of Thrones, Westeros Intrigue. There's always a few board game geek forums about thrifting that are going on, and Hunter Shelburne of the Weapons Grade Tabletop YouTube channel has a really good Big Game Hunter series about his thrifting exploits, which is pretty good. But other than that, I haven't really seen much else about thrifting being talked about. Is there something out there that I'm missing? So here we are at one of my local thrift stores. Let's go in and see if we find any hidden treasures today. Well, so far, 
We're just being greeted by the usual thrift store fare. Let's see, we have Sport Seen It, Sport Seen It Still in Shrink, Twilight Seen It, Seen It Silver Tin Edition, TV Seen It, Blue Box Seen It, and TV Seen It and Blue Box Seen It side by side. Aww, they found each other. Jumanji was tempting, but really I, I don't know where I'd keep the disoriented middle-aged man that comes trapped in the box. If you act now, you can not only get a copy of Camp Rock, but also a backup copy of Camp Rock, just in case you accidentally throw your original copy of Camp Rock into an incinerator. Found a copy of the little-known game Kl. So I wasn't finding any good games, so I turned my attention to finding something that I could just play ironically. I was just about to grab the Twilight the Movie board game, but then I discovered the Twilight Saga New Moon the Movie board game. <laughs> There's no way that I could decide between those and the third Twilight Saga New Moon the Movie board game collectible commemorative tin edition. So in the end, I just couldn't choose between them and I, I ended up having to leave them all behind. I was just about to give up on finding anything today, good or bad, when I stumbled upon my find of the day. Well, that's the risk you take when you go thrifting. Sometimes you find a hidden treasure, like the time I found a copy of Filthy Rich, a really underestimated little board game that I really love. Then other times you come home with Justin Bieber backstage pass. Huh. Do you thrift? And if so, what percentage of the time do you come home with hidden gems? Empty handed? Or worse? Let me know in the comments below. Five more expansions uh, that I really, really enjoy. We're still, of course, uh, down at the very bottom of them, but let's get going here. First, we have their Blood Bowl Sudden Death. Now, Blood Bowl's a game, Blood Bowl Team Manager. Um, Blood Bowl Team Manager is a game I think is kind of underrated by many people. It's kind of like taking the concept of area control. It's like taking Smash Up, in a sense, and adding kind of a, a heavier game behind it. And Sudden Death didn't like really upend the game. It just added some more teams, but two teams I really like, the Undead and the Vampires. The Undead, I like them because even when they fall down, they can do things. And then it added some other minor tweaks like Magic Balls that did different things. But it was just a nice expansion. More of the same with a few minor tweaks. That's kind of one of my favorite types of expansions. Then we have here Reef Encounters of the Second Kind. Now, Reef Encounters is a game that I don't see many people talking about today, but it's really an excellent, strategically tactical game of placing tiles. It's a beautiful game about building a reef, but mean and in your face, trying to use fish to eat the reef and, and, and just form the reefs and going after other players' reefs. Really cool. Reef Encounters of the Second Kind added some cards, which was okay, but it also added like double tiles and tiles that were two different colors and just kind of did some minor variations on the game. And I thought it was a good addition to the game. Not necessary. I mean, Reef Encounters, it was never a game I sat around and thought, huh, this game needs an expansion. But this expansion was nice, fit inside the box easily, and added more to the game. Then we are at Buffaloes. <laughs> now, this seems like an odd one here. Buffaloes is an expansion to a game called Hippos and Crocs. Now, Hippos and Crocs is a great little two-player abstract game where you have two different shapes, one a hippo and one a crocodile, and you place them on the board until you can't place anymore, and when you can't place, you lose. A simple game easy to play, but one that I've played over and over and over and over and over again. Water buffaloes, or I'm sorry, it's called buffaloes, adds the water buffalo tile. So now you have three different factions to work with. It's just another shape, but also comes with a bigger thing and adds that you can play the game three players. And I like that. That added things up. So when you lose, you can pick which person you'll be. So if you think water buffaloes definitely beat crocodiles, well, that's fine, but I, I don't think that's true. But you could switch over perhaps when you lost. Just a cool little addition, turned a two-player game into a three-player game or into a two-player game with one more option. Then we have Battlestar Galactica Pegasus. Now, as much as I like Battlestar Galactica and think it's a great game, you, it's kind of odd maybe that this expansion is so far down on my list. But I, I don't think Battlestar needs its expansions, but I mentioned Pegasus for a few things. There are parts of Pegasus which I will never play with again, New Caprica and all that. But there are parts of it that are pretty cool. The Pegasus board, I think, adds a lot. It helps the humans out some. It has the airlock, which adds a different dimension to the game. It has plastic, um, plastic uh, bat battle, not battle stars, plastic uh, 
Cylon ships, uh, whatever they were called, um, and and moving those around and and adding those and more characters. It added a bunch of characters. People were like, oh, I need these characters for the game. It was kind of the first expansion to do that. And just like Pegasus was a big addition in the, in the series, this was a big addition to the base game. So it's nice to have it. I only would use maybe 50% of it or so, but that 50% is pretty good. And then finally, Cosmic Encounter Conflict. This is the second expansion that they came out for the new Fantasy Flight version of Cosmic Encounter. Nothing really great here. Added hazards, which were okay, but I love Cosmic. And 20 more aliens, including uh, the, the Lunatic and Warhawk. Those guys are fun. And the Claw, which was a great one. And then the black, if you like black ships and the color black, using that in the game. So those are five more expansions, but we got to keep moving. are invading our world, destroying all our resources and abducting our girls. A flying saucers, man, we don't stand a chance. Deploying all our soldiers as the crap in their pants. XCOM is freaking insane. Whether on a border or on a video game. XCOM is blowing your mind. You're running out of money as you run out of time. Between the aliens and humanity Scramble satellites as they take the base Do your very best to save the whole human race XCOM is run by an app You're running out of time as your pants fill up with crap Oh man, wish they'd leave us alone But the mutons and that thin man, they desire a home Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. What could go better together than chocolate and peanut butter or apple pie and ice cream? Kingsburg and Cthulhu, of course, or someone thought that. Today I'm completing my two-part feature on Kingsburg and Kingsport Festival by taking a look at the Lovecraftian dice game. In Kingsburg Festival, oh, I'm sorry, Kingsport Festival, you play a cultist trying to bring the glory of the old ones to the world through magical invocations and fighting off those pesky investigators. Your dice determine which monsters you can use to gather up resources so that you can take control of buildings and gain cult points, aka victory points. Honestly, this is just Cthulhu Kingsburg with a couple of twists. Although I'd played Kingsburg, I struggled with Kingsport Festival a bit having not played the real game because there were a lot of similarities, but a few key elements like the sanity track and spell cards weren't really well explained. And like the Kingsburg app from the same developer, Kingsport Festival suffers from inexcusably poor graphic design choices. The art, if you like horror, is actually really well done. But once again, critical info like the cost and benefit of a building is buried. And in this app, there are so many things pulsing and flashing. Active screen areas are not intuitive, and everything is visually chaotic, which is a shame because the gameplay itself provides interesting choices with the dice and is surprisingly strategic. One of the biggest improvements over the Kingsburg app is that you aren't forced to watch the rolling and selection process of your AI opponents, which helps speed up the game. And hey, Kingsport Festival is available for Android and iOS. I agree with Tom. Kingsport Festival is the better game. And the app is the better app compared to Kingsburg. But Kingsport Festival is still plagued with terrible graphic design and user interface choices. So if you're looking for this kind of game, you like the theme, and you understand that the UI takes some getting used to, then give this one a try. Now, as I said earlier in the segment, that the Board Game Geek Awards were announced. Now, the Board Game Geek Awards are basically picked by the users of Board Game Geek, which, since it just passed 1 million users, is easily the largest board game website in the world. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff going on there. The awards are, are I, I think the best way to look at them is kind of a People's Choice Award. Now, there's some... 
uh, restrictions on this. You have to be a paid donator to the website or to pay 20 geek gold, which is Board Game Geek's virtual currency, which you get for posting things and, and putting up pictures and maybe modding some of the stuff. Basically, you have to do a little bit of work, not a lot to get it. So you have there's some restrictions, but there's still many, 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 many votes. So they're the People Choice Awards. Well, they announced all the awards, and then go check out their website so you can see what they all are. Uh, but the biggest one was the Game of the Year, which went to Splendor. Other ones, uh, the two-player game went to Star Realms, Innovative Game and Thematic Game went to Dead of Winter, and there were two runner-ups in each of categories. And as a disclaimer, they added the Board Game Podcast Award this year, and Dice Tower won that, which is pretty nice, and thank you to everyone who voted for that. But as soon as they announced the wars, the uproar happened. Now, of course, uproar is going to happen because this is the internet. But I thought it was kind of interesting watching the uproar towards this at the same time, or just a week or so after, the Oscars were announced. Now, me and my friends had this huge discussion about this. We played board games one day, and after we were done, we all sat down to eat, and we were talking, and we were talking about Oscar movies, and I was complaining how the Oscars never match what I find interesting, and they never seem to match what the people find interesting. You know, most of the time, if you go back and look at Oscar nominees, they're just movies I don't really care about, while movies that I really like, like let's say, for example, Guardians of the Galaxy, wouldn't even have a shot at that. And that's because the Oscars are looking for something different than I am. I'm looking for pure fun and entertainment in movies, and I don't mind movies that make me think, um, or movies, but I still want to be entertained. For example, I really like The Truman Show because it makes me think, you know, it's interesting a look at society and such, but at the same time, it was an entertaining flick. And so that's kind of what I'm looking for, and it doesn't jive with the Oscars at all. So I'm like, eh, I'd rather find out what the people think is the best. Of course, what the people want isn't the best all the time, right? Otherwise, I mean, I don't have cable anymore, but when I was at a hotel going through cable, yeah, there's a lot of dreck out there, right? Reality shows, uh, the out, out in the food world, the popularity of McDonald's. And so what the people want isn't always right, but what the snobby elitist want isn't right either, is it? Well, the, the truth is there's no right answer, right? You're going to look for an award that matches what you think, and that's what's going to make you happy. So that's what people do. People like watching the Oscars because of all the glitz and glamour, but at the end of the day, they're going to complain about it or not. So back to Board Game Geek. These awards, people are like, how could Splendor have won? And yada, 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 yada. The truth is, folks, Splendor won because it's just popularity is immense. Now, I know there's people who hate it and there's people who, who, who like it a lot. I tend to be someone who likes it very much so. But let's put another game in this category that I don't like, and that's the DC Deck Builder, right? I'm not a big fan of that one, but that one is also quite popular. So when I see games like this, and when I see them being played when they came out, which was about a year ago, Splendor first came out, and I see it played consistently, consistently, at all the conventions I went to, I saw Splendor being played somewhere. At the meetups I'm at, it is played by somebody in our group pretty much every single week. I see other games like Five Tribes and Dead of Winter. These are also games that are constantly being played and bringing enjoyment to people. So I think that when we look at these games, we go, pff, pff, can't be best game of the year. Well, obviously, a lot of people did think it was the best game of the year. And when, again, I go, pff, that's stupid, I have to be careful that I'm not going and calling all those people who voted for it, like, ah, you're just a bunch of sheep. I know what's truly best. The Board Game Geek Awards are the people's choice, and the people chose Splendor. And I think that was fine, just like for two-player game, Star Realms, a game I see people playing all the time. I think that's a great choice. Dead of Winter for Innovative, something I agree with highly. Um, thematics, another thing I agree with highly. I, it, I think it's fine that they won. But let's say I didn't agree, but a lot of other people did. That's, that's fine. Now, the Dice Tower Awards are coming, and we're taking a different tack on these, where we will be looking at these awards, and basically, we have a smaller group of people who play a lot of games. And we may not pick Splendor for Game of the Year. I don't know, because I'm only one out of 60 people or so who's voting on this. So I, we may not pick Splendor of the Year, but that's not to say it's a bad game. And I think we have to be very cautious about the, <laughs> this whole elitist thing, because here's the deal. 
If someone new is coming into gaming and they're like, hey, what's the best game that came out last year? And you hand them Splendor, you know what the chances are? They're going to enjoy it. But if you hand them your, you know, this, this is most definitely, let's say Kanban, okay? I haven't played Kanban yet, but it's a very heavy game. You hand it to someone new, they may enjoy it, and they may not. But the chances are not quite so good. And you say, but Tom, popularity does not equal how good something is. I think you're right, but it doesn't mean it doesn't. It doesn't mean it's not an indicator either. Anyhow. Just some thoughts I have. I'd love to see what you guys think about the awards. I know everyone's uh, not for them, but I think Board Game Geek did a fine job with them. And, uh, well, still a little bit of the show left. We've been talking about rules lawyering at our gaming table. Rules are made to be broken, and lawyers are made to be killed, right? Well, as we discussed last time, rules lawyering has its roots in RPGs specifically this one. RPGs are different animals from all but a few board games, where rather than having all the players competing against each other, you have just one player act against an adversary for the rest of the group. Kind of like a maze controller, whose authority is absolute in the game. I am the maze controller, and I have absolute authority in this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah you get the idea. One of the problems that grew out of primitive RPGs is that the Game Master might occasionally abuse his authority at the expense of his friends. No! Why? Why did he give this out? <laughs> Early systems had no kind of recourse for victimized players, but as the hobby made advancements, more players' rights were developed. So the term rules lawyer was coined as a pejorative by DMs who reacted to this brooch on their authority with about the same grace as, say, Prince John when he was forced to sign the Magna Carta. And we are forced to sign your precious Magna Carta, forced by you. I am God's right hand! And that prejudice has spilled over into the average board game. I ran into this problem recently when playing, of all games, Lords of Waterdeep. Another player seemed to be fudging what was permissible in a certain round, so I asked for a second to check the manual. And this individual spat back, oh sure, just rules lawyer me. See, while if a dungeon master's job is to tell a good story rather than just screw with the other players, I will tower. Oh. he should have the authority to bend the rules in his game. Game? But in a board game, all the players are equal competitors. And if you're acting contrary to the framework of that game, game. then I'm not rules lawyering you, but you are, albeit unintentionally, cheating. So should we kill all the rules lawyers? Well, maybe. And now it's time to end Board Game Breakfast. Guys, thank you so much for watching the show as normal. Come back tonight at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time, and I'll do some questions and answers then, and look for us putting up some more content for you guys this week. Hey, we are one-sixth of the year is over, but winter's almost over. We can see summer approaching. Isn't that exciting? Hey, folks, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.